And this is uh, based in part on this project that I just finished, uh, that I collaborated on with several colleagues of mine who are working on this general area. Um, so what can we say about research on sexuality and urbanization so far? You know, I, I think of it as, until very recently, it's been largely Western slash Northern based. And within that context, certainly there's been a strong tradition in urban sociology of focusing on, particularly on um, sexuality has uh, gay, in relation to gay and lesbian usages of space, or um, for example, analyses of the closet as metaphor, which is something that certainly has been disputed in non-Western contexts has, has, has a metaphor that doesn't work. Um, and uh, much emphasis on the capitalist regulation of sexuality in general. Geography is another field that's focused quite a bit on this, particularly emphasizing space and spatialization. Um, and I'm certainly drawn here from development of post-colonial studies that has looked at sexuality as central to processes of colonization, from everything from various kinds of sexual violence that have occurred through processes of colonization to how the, the family was defined to miscegenation laws that, in the case of, of Latin America, divided indigenous from uh, families of Spanish origin um, to uh, laws, ar archaic family laws concerning homosexuality and um, various kinds of family codes. So that, that relate to, for example, women's uh, inheritance rights and so on that feminist scholars have been working on for a long time. Um, and, and last but certainly not least, feminist and queer studies, which is, has emphasized the denaturalizing of categories of gender, sex, and sexuality, which is incredibly useful for this work. And at the same time, sometimes involves a kind of cultural translation that complicates how we can think about these issues in um, so-called non-Western context. If we think about this historically, certainly the role of population policy is absolutely key to thinking about how um, intimate forms of intimacy and familial arrangements have been regulated, at least at the policy and legal levels. Population policies although there are many critics at this point, uh, still continues to be heavily assumed as a given, um, the, kind of the, 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 the basic tenets of it in much development policy. And I'm talking here from macroeconomic development frameworks that supposedly do not address specific individuals um, to various kinds of social and reproductive policies that more or sexual, sexual health policies that more specifically address um, individuals in relation to their sexual practices. Um, the gender and development field has been an important part of both uh, supporting and critiquing population policy. Um, I just, in, to, there, there's a lot to be said about that field, um, but I, I, would, I would say that generally, uh, feminist scholars in that field have, have relied on a heteronormative notion of the family, so that some of the critiques I'm providing here do not necessarily emerge in that literature. And then there's the emergent field of sexuality and development that is really coming out of specific institutions like, um, I always think of Sweden, because if you read their foreign policy statement on their website, uh, it's probably the most explicit and progressive with regard to sexual rights. And by sexual rights, I'm, um, what, 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 what the Swedish government and other agencies are, are, are tending to emphasize is the right to bodily integrity, the right to the expression of one's identity, um, and the right to self-determination uh, in, in relation to how one expresses him or herself or um, practices their sexuality, so to speak. And so they're making these interesting links with these other processes. And certainly one of the, I think one of, one of the reasons why this has um, been so absent and seen as so taboo to even talk about this by governments and by various other kinds of agencies is because there's this assumption that sexuality is not a survival issue. And I really 
should have put that in my PowerPoint. Um, because that's really at the center of this. Uh, the, the fact that, the, 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 that anything that is viewed as a form of intimacy or sexual expression or gender expression is not related to material survival. And, and we see that over and over again in, in, in development frameworks. Here I'm just giving a few examples of the centrality of population policy or this, this notion that we need to control populations as a way to advance uh, national modernization projects, as a way to integrate the nation into modernity and so on. Um, this is a sign from China that says, please, for the sake of your country, use birth control. So there's this very clear connection between um, the reproductive imperative, as some call it, and national progress. In the case of China, that has been the emphasis on abortion and on the one-child policy that has been revised a few different times now. Um, here's a, a poster from Zambia that comes out of the HIV AIDS, um, I guess, uh, area of global development. It says, a real woman puts her future ahead of sexual relationships. A real woman waits. So there's this idea of uh, 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 respectability that one sees over and over again in representations and discourses of how to integrate women into development and how and what counts as a good family versus a bad family, that one could make a lot of comparisons with this and discussions that have taken place within the US that I don't really have time to get into. But certainly the issue of respectability is interesting here. And then that link to national progress or you know the future of the nation, the future of this woman, the, the future of the nation resides in the future of, of this woman, so to speak. Um, yet another, this one kind of um, blows me away. This comes out of the ABC uh, policy era of that, that fortunately Obama, one of his first policy moves was to remove that policy of uh, abstain, be faithful, use condoms that the George W. Bush administration had really pushed, particularly in relation to HIV AIDS funding in Africa. But that, that had serious and significant effects throughout the world in terms of how governments could implement various kinds of projects that had to do with uh, sexual education, for example. And this is they call the petrol pump diagram. It comes out of this gender and HIV um, handbook, training handbook. And, so, and they call it pouring information into an empty head abstain, be faithful, use condoms. So there's very pouring education into this woman's head. So these very, um, really intense images of what needs to be done to uh, allow for national progress. Um, and more recently, well, we've had long-standing struggles concerning the family. Abortion in Latin America has certainly been a huge issue. One of the most publicized issues, shall we say. This is just an example of um, an interesting, uh, an exception, that uh, being that abortion is primarily uh, illegal throughout the region. Um, the decriminalization of early term abortion in Mexico City in 2007 was a really interesting phenomenon in itself. And um, certainly one of the things that we're seeing is this, even with the shift to the left in the region, is uh, a retrenchment around issues pertaining to abortion. So, and that, in a lot of ways, has to do with ideas that circulate across national borders, networks that exist across national borders, and then how those ideas and resources are used in local settings to debate issues concerning the family as it relates to national development in that setting. New struggles have emerged. Just in July of this year, Argentina passed a federal same-sex marriage law, and <laughs> which is really fascinating because Argentina has uh, often seen as, as I mean, if you go back to the days of the military dictatorship, the Catholic Church.